It's time for The Bondage Breaker with Tom Brown, a program designed to help you find your freedom and victory in Christ. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one, the devil, who's in the world. We, we want to welcome you who are watching by television to Word of Life Church, home of the Mission Cathedral, where people find freedom and victory in Christ. Last night before I went to bed, I had this wire that came right down. Maybe you got the same wire. It happened last night. The Supreme Court Justices Ginsburg and Kennedy were in the parking lot after the big fireworks show and the 4th of July celebrations. They were trying to unlock the door of Ginsburg's car with a coat hanger because they had accidentally left the keys in the car. Kennedy complained to Ginsburg, I can't seem to get this door unlocked. And he tried desperately to maneuver the, court, uh, the coat hanger. Well, I wish you would hurry up, Ginsburg replied. It's starting to rain, and the top is down. <laughs> All right. How many of y'all brought your Bibles, lift them up real high, make Jesus glad and the devil sad? Say, this is my Bible. It is the Word of God. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. And I have what it says I have. I boldly declare that my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, and my cell phone is off in Jesus' name. Turn to someone, look him straight in the eye and say, did you hear that, child of God? I will never, ever, ever be the same again. Well, God bless you. You look marvelous. If you would, open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And now, Father, give me the grace to teach this message to all the wonderful people that have come out and those watching by television and online. Minister to them by your spirit. And I know, Lord, you have a word in due season. Give it to them today. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans chapter 12, I want us to read verse 6. We're going to read it from the King James Version. If you don't have that version, just look up on the big screen, and you can read it along with us. Romans 12, 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Would you all say that last part with me, starting with let us? Let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Did you know you can prophesy according to the level of your faith? What does prophesy mean? It literally comes from a Greek word which means to predict the future through words. Your words will predict your future. They will prophesy and determine what kind of life you're going to have. And, and it's based on your faith. Can you all say faith? faith? See, notice he says, let us prophesy according to the proportion. That word proportion means level. What is your faith level? Do you believe you're going to be rich? Then prophesy. Do you believe you're going to be healthy? Prophesy. Do you believe your children are going to serve God? Prophesy. it. Do you believe your husband's going to get saved? Prophesy it. Do you believe your business is going to prosper? Prophesy it. You can prophesy according to your faith. But a lot of folks, they have faith in the negative. They have faith that things aren't going to work out well. You know, my life's never going to work out well. You know, I never seem to have enough money. If I ever get money, I have holes in the pocket. You know, if something, if the flu comes around, I always get it, and I get it twice. You know, I don't understand. You know, I'm always sick. I'm always broke. I, no one ever seems to like me. Nobody cares about my life. Blah, 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 blah. And then you get what you've been saying because whether you realize it, you are prophesying your life. You're determining the kind of life you get by the words you say. So Paul says, let us, he's not even limited it to just those who are prophets. Let us, he's using all of us. He got so excited with this gift of prophecy, he says we can all to a certain degree prophesy. Let us prophesy. Let us speak the future. How do we do it? God's words are prophecies. In fact, St. Peter says, scriptures are prophecies of prophets. In other words, you're reading prophecies. You're reading your future. You're reading God's prediction for your life. You know what we call it? Promises. 
Think about what a promise is. If someone says, I promise to take you to Western Plainland, I promise to take you to Wet and Wild, I promise to take you to Disneyland. Now you get excited about that one. But what is that? That's a prediction. It's a prediction of the person who's promising. Well, we all know the Bible is full, is pro uh, full of promises. And what are promises? They are God's prediction of what he's going to do for you. He promises to heal you, prosper you, give you a sound mind. He gives you promise that you're a new creation. You're the righteousness of God. You're the temple of the Holy Ghost. The power of the Spirit is in you. These are promises. But listen, promises from God doesn't do you any good unless you take the promises, let it burn in your heart, and speak it out of your mouth. Only when you speak it does the promises become a prophecy for you. Did you all get that or did it go over your head? See, and so that's what we have. We have, in a nutshell, God's prediction for your life. And if you want to know how your life's going to turn out, read the back of the book. You win. There was a friend of mine. Yeah, give the Lord a hand clap. That's all right. You know, I had a friend of mine that is a Dallas Cowboy fanatic, but she doesn't, she never watches the Dallas Cowboys live. She always videotaped it, or now she TiVos it. Because why? She wants to find out in advance if we win or lose. If we win, she watches the game. And she doesn't get uptight when Tony Romo throws another interception. I should have said just interception, not another one. She doesn't get upset when, you know, one of our defensive backs let a wide receiver go for a long touchdown pass. Doesn't get upset because she knows we won. Listen, in your life, you're going to go through ups and downs, difficulties with health, difficulties financially, difficulties with your children, difficulties at work, difficulties with our country. You know, and you're in the middle, and you don't like what you're seeing. Hold it. Read the back of the book. You win. You're going to be made in the image of Jesus Christ. Read the back of the book. Jesus is riding on the horse, and he triumphs and defeats the forces of darkness. Amen. The Antichrist is thrown in the lake of fire. Hello. And in your life, your life is a picture of the church. You're going through ups and downs, going through difficulties. But in those difficulties, we're to stop and speak the word and say what the word says about us. This is what the patriarchs understood. In Hebrews 11:20, it says, By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau regarding their future. Notice, they blessed them regarding their few they understood the power of blessings to say something positive about their children and their words they believed now get this they believed their words were divine and that those words were going to make the prediction come true they believed it they knew the power of words they knew they were made in the image of God. And just as God created by words, let there be light. Let this. His words created everything. They knew being in God's image meant they could create by words. And even though there was darkness, they could say, light be. Jesus saw sickness and he says, healing be. He saw what no one else saw. Because he was taking God's word and using it to predict the future of other people. And you have the power to predict. What you say is what you're going to get. This is why God told Israel that when you have a religious gathering and before everyone is dismissed to their homes, don't let them be dismissed until the priest gives them a benediction. And they were ordered to give benedictions before everyone left. Why? Because they knew the power of words. So the priest in office would lift up his hands to the people. And the first words coming out of his mouth is, May the Lord bless you and keep you. Notice the first thing, may the Lord bless you. It, 
didn't matter if Israel wasn't living right. May God bless you. Even if they were in disobedience, may God bless you. They believed in the power of blessing. I love our church. You know, we have our weaknesses and there are things we could do better. But there's one thing I've noticed in this church. They love the benediction. I hardly see anyone leave the church. There might be occasionally one or two families that take off thinking that they need to get in their car before everybody provides a traffic jam. But most of the, almost everyone stays. And when I issue the benediction, it's awesome because then I see people lifting their hands to receive that benediction. It's a great action. And see, and that's what we need to understand, my brothers and sisters, how powerful the benediction is. And you who understand the power of words, when the bishop stretches his hands and issues the benediction, what is benediction? Bene means favor. Diction, as we know in English, diction is your, your words, your dictionary, your dictionary. We get that word. Words, you say a blessing. And when you know and believe in that, then those words that the bishop utters at, at the benediction goes into your life and creates a positive future. But you have to believe it. We prophesy according to the level or proportion of our faith. Go to 1 Kings chapter 17. Let, let's see this type of prophecy in action in the Bible, all right? 1 Kings chapter 17. Let's give a background here. Israel had fallen into idolatry. They started to worship this false god called Baal, uh, instead of the immortal, invisible, eternal god, Jehovah, they started to worship a temporal, a ma material god called Baal. Well, God had told Israel that if you ever turned away from me, Deuteronomy 28, 24 says, if you turn from me, then I will turn the rain into dust and powder. And yet, even though they turned away from God, the people were still having rain. But Elijah is reading this passage. God will turn it into dust and powder, but yet he's seen the rain. But God says, I'll turn it into dust and powder, but he's seen the rain. And he knew, I know the, the missing link. There's not a prophet to prophesy that word. So we read here in 1 Kings 17, 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, Ahab was the king of Israel, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Now why did Elijah make this pronouncement? He's not making it up. He's not saying, what would I like to see happen? No, he's reading the word. The word already told them that there would be a drought. He said there's going to be a drought in the land. But yet there was no drought because there was no prophet to speak it. And notice Elijah links God's word with his own because he ends it with saying, it's not going to happen except at my word. You know what he's saying? My word that's coming out of my mouth is going to be the reason there will be a drought. And when, I, when with my word I release the blessing, it's going to come back. The blessings will come. That might seem very arrogant, but it was bold. He understood, though, it wasn't just his word. He's speaking God's word. God said you would have a drought if you disobeyed me. But he needed to say it in order for God's word to be released. And here's the moral principle I want you to get. God's word has many promises, but today we're not living under a curse. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. You're redeemed from the curse of sin, condemnation, the curse of sickness, the curse of poverty, the curse of demonic spirits, the, the curse of the generational curse. You are redeemed. But listen, all the blessings that God says about you, just like in Israel's, just like in Israel's time, just like in Elijah's time, it wasn't released until a man spoke it. And the blessings are not released until you speak it, until you give a benediction to your life. You have to say it. 
And when you say, by Jesus' stripes I'm healed, healing comes. When you say, my God meets all my needs, prosperity comes. When you say, the angels of the Lord protect me, God gives you protection and preservation. When you say, all my children shall know the Lord, then God begins to work on your backslidden children, your prodigals, to bring them back to Jesus. When you say, my marriage will be strong and my husband will get saved, God begins to work on your husband, convicts him until he gets saved. See, you've got to say it. But if you're saying, oh, my husband's worse. My business is going under. Oh, the pain is worse. Then you are predicting that to happen. So you have to stop and say, no, I'm not going to predict it. I'm saying a blessing over my life. I'm going to say what God says. And so when you say it, then your word is linked with God's and your word becomes divine power so that God backs up his word because you spoke it. You see, you have to speak it, though. You have to say what God says. Well, that's what happened. Three and a half years, a drought hit Israel. But a, a dramatic event happened. God sent fire down, consumed the, a sacrifice that Elijah had set up. The people repented. Israelites were so sorry for worshiping the Baal that they turned back to God and said, we are sorry, we serve God. Now they've repented. Now, what is supposed to happen if they repent? The blessing should come. So the moment they repent, the prophet Elijah says to his servant, let's go on top of Mount Carmel. And, and here's what he says in verse 41. And Elijah said to Ahab, go eat and drink, for there is a, what does he say? A sound. Can you all say a sound? Of heavy rain. King James says there's a sound of abundance. He believes it. And he takes a servant on top of Mount Carmel. And he says, let's pray. God's about to do something for Israel. He's about to bring blessings again. And he falls on his knees. He puts his head between his legs. And the servant is just watching him. He gets up and he looks. And he says, do you hear it? The servant says, hear what, my master? Don't you hear the rain? The servant paused for a moment. He said, no, sir, I, I don't hear any. Go look to the Mediterranean Sea. There's, there's rain coming. I hear it. So the servant, with excitement, runs over to the other side of the mountain. And then he looks. He sees just pure blue sky, not a single cloud. He's discouraged. He comes back and says, sorry, you're hearing things, sir. There's nothing going on. And the, Elijah said, go back again. I'm telling you, I hear it. He goes back and still nothing. He returns back and says, sir, there is no no, no, there, there's nothing. There's no rain. Go back again. He says, okay, I'll go back, but I've already checked it twice. He checks it three times. He goes back and says, look, I've already checked three times. He says, go back again. Oh, okay, I'll go back again. He goes back to the fourth time. Still nothing. And as he goes back, and says, there's nothing, but I guess you want me to go back again. Is that right? Yes, go back. All right, I'll go back again. And on the seventh time, the prophet goes, and there's a little cloud the size of a man's hand. He's thinking, should I tell the servant? Should I tell the prophet this? This is nothing. It's just, it's just a small cloud. That's all. It, it's just small. But he goes back, and he says, now listen, I don't want to get your hopes high. This time, I see a little cloud. But listen, it's small. It's teeny-weeny. It's, it's not significant. It's, it's nothing, just a little, little cloud. We've seen little clouds before. There's nothing. But the prophet of God said, that's it. Hurry up. The rain's coming.
coming. See, God likes to use small things to do great things. Just like you use a small cloud to bring abundance, God took, takes little things in people's hands to do great things. I think of Samson holding the jawbone of a donkey. What kind of weapon is that? But that was a weapon he used to kill a thousand Philistines. Zerubbabel, governor of Judah. For 70 years, Israel had lost their land. Their temple had been destroyed. There wasn't one brick left. And then one day, through the prophet Zechariah, Micah, other prophets were talking to him. He got this zeal. And this governor of Israel, uh, Judah, excuse me, governor of Judah, walks where the temple used to be. You know what he does? He takes a plumb line, and he holds up a plumb line. Now, what's a plumb line? It's a ruler for contractors, for construction. So he's holding a ruler for construction. That's all he does. He holds it. And then all of a sudden, the Jews look at the governor, and that ruler, that plumb line, draws the Jews to him and says, is there something we could do? Well, I'm glad you asked. There's some bricks over there. Why don't you go bring it over? You're a carpenter. Why don't you go cut down some trees? We, we'll, we'll use that. And all of a sudden, people with talent started to come to What was it? Just a plumb line. Something insignificant that God uses to touch a nation. I think of the, one of my favorite ones are four lepers. These four men with leprosy, they, they get discouraged. They say, listen, let's just go to the camp of the Arameans. Let's just surrender. If they kill us, we're dead. But we're going to die of starvation anyway. So in faith, they started to walk to the camp of the Arameans. God took those four lepers, and he made their steps sound like a vast army. All of a sudden, the army said, do you hear it? There, there's an army coming after us. Hurry, let's get out. And they run out. They leave, and they get scared of four lepers. God has a way to take four men and make them sound like a mighty army. God took 300 soldiers of Gideon to defeat thousands of the Midianites. Listen, God has a way to take the small and make it something big. What small thing is God doing in your life? He wants to use those small things to make something big. Take the small cake of bread that the widow had. She had a little flour, a little oil in her hands. Not much, but by faith she gave it. And that flour and that oil never ran dry. She fed her family. She fed Elijah. Why? Because she had faith in what was in her hands. Though it was small, it became big to God. And whatever is in your hands, it will become big to God. And I suppose what I'm trying to tell you is if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can move mountains. You are watching The Bondage Breaker with Bishop Tom Brown. To receive today's message in its entirety, call us now at 915-855-WORD. That's 915-855-9673. If you prefer to request the message by mail, then follow the information on the screen and don't forget to specify today's title. Bishop Brown's ministry of spiritual deliverance is well known in America and around the world. His message of freedom and victory in Christ is found in his best-selling books. Come by Word of Life Church for an autographed copy. Word of Life Church has a first-class children's ministry with small classrooms so children have more individual attention. Children also get to enjoy one of the largest indoor playgrounds in the city. Many parents are concerned for their teenagers. Be at ease. Here at Word of Life Church, your teenagers will feel like they are a part of a group of youth that are truly committed to Christ. You won't find better music anywhere in El Paso than by our church band. Our talented musicians and singers will lift your spirits up to God as they play the latest music while incorporating the great classical hymns. Fellowship is important to us, so we have provided a relaxing atmosphere in our expanded coffee shop. Enjoy a latte or fresh pastry while you make new friends. Word of Life Church believes in helping those in need. 
Word of Life quietly helps provide food, clothing, and aid to the needy. Visit us at Word of Life Church and make a positive difference, not only in your own life, but the lives of others. Word of Life Church meets every Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m. and 1.30 p.m. for Spanish. Bible study is on Tuesday at 7.15 p.m. The church meets at 11675 Pratt Avenue. That's near the intersection of Pebble Hills and Saul Kleinfeld across from Walmart. For more information about this spirit-filled church, call 855-9673. That's 855-WORD. Well, my wife and I just got back from visiting the George Bush Presidential uh, Library. It was really fascinating. And of course, it was quite moving to see 9-11 and all that he, as well as our nation, really went through. You know, as I was kind of going through the museum, I started to think about America. America truly is a Christian nation. At least it was founded on Christian principles. And I know atheists, agnostics, and secularists, they lie to America saying that America is, is purely a secular country. That really is not true. When you look at our Constitution, it begins with uh, actually the, the Declaration of Independence, which provides the foundation for our Constitution. And what does the Declaration of Independence says? It says, we believe that God the Creator gave us certain inalienable rights. And so right away, our forefathers understood that our country was built on the belief in God and that He gives us our, our rights, that those rights are derived from above, not from government, and that it's government's job to make sure not to intrude on those rights. And when you look at our Constitution, the first amendment of the Constitution, it's about the freedom of religion and the influence that religion would have on our country and that our country and our government was not to intrude on that. And of course, uh, our, our government understood how important it was to have a Christian influence. So immediately when we became a country, they hired a chaplain, a Christian chaplain that has been part of the U.S. Congress ever since. And, and then, of course, we have the tradition of putting our hands on the Bible. Every government officer swears to uphold the Constitution by laying their hand on the Bible. There you find the Christian influence. And many of the constitutional amendments are based on Christian principles. Listen, don't let the secularists lie to you, telling you that we ought to keep religion and Christianity in particular in the backdrop. But no, it is the foundation that has made our country great. It's not just the democracy. It's who we are as a people. At Word of Life Church, we're trying to uphold the, that tradition and trying to encourage uh, America to go back to its roots. And that, that root is faith in Jesus Christ and the morality that we get from Him. That's what makes our nation great. Well, if you're looking for a church that upholds that, why don't you come by Word of Life Church? We have two Sunday morning services, 9 and 11 on Sunday morning, and 1.30 for Spanish on Sunday. It's a great church for the whole family. We look forward to seeing you there uh, this Sunday. Well, right here in front of the George Bush Presidential Library, I want to leave you with the words of Jesus who said, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free.